Well, welcome. Um, I'm Peter Kern, the director of the Minor in Global Public Health. Uh, it's good to see students who are in the Global Grizzlies here. They always have this part of the auditorium <laughs> to themselves. Uh, and then there are students in my Issues in Global Public Health class. Hooray for them as well. Uh, and we have people from the community. So what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to sign in. If you're a student, sign in there. Uh, it, that is, if you're a student enrolled in this class. If you're a student in, um, in my class or if you're a member of the community, we ask you to sign in the community sheet that's back there as well. Okay, so please do that before you leave today. So we have a, a really special program tonight, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speakers. Uh, uh, first of all, I've worked uh, very closely uh, with Mary Nielsen on setting up this lecture series, and I really appreciate all of her interest and cooperation as we've moved ahead. Uh, so Mary is a registered nurse. She graduated from College St. Teresa in Minnesota in 1978, and then she moved with Tim to Montana. Uh, they only planned to stay a couple of years, uh, but uh, <laughs> they've been here ever since. Uh, she has a master's degree in nursing education from Clarkston College in Nebraska. Uh, her areas of practice over the last 39 years have been in multiple areas of adult patient care, nursing management, and nursing education. She spent the last 25 years at Missoula College as a faculty member, nursing program director, health professions chair, and now Health Care Montana Nursing Curriculums Director. Tim is a physical therapist. He graduated from Coe College in Iowa. In 1976, he attended the Mayo Clinic Physical Therapy School, where he graduated in 1978. Immediately, he moved to Montana, where he accepted a position at Community Medical Center. For the past 32 years, he's worked in private practice, owning the, physical, the Valley Physical Therapy. Uh, he enjoys a variety of rec they both enjoy a variety of recreational activities that you can all define in Montana. That's that may be right. why they stay here. <laughs> um, now that we have a very special guest this evening. Um, we have on him. Lee from Tanzania who has uh, worked with Tim and Mary uh, on the projects they're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so I'll let them introduce uh, the bishop, uh, but I will just finally mention that the topic of their talk tonight is, I can find it. It's right there. Oh, all right, here we go. <laughs> the Medgiver Healthcare System in Tanzania. There so we please, go. Let's join me in welcoming them. <laughs> so um, actually, we were supposed to um, have lectured or presented last week, but we told Bishop, it, I mean, we told Peter that if we presented this week we could actually bring a show and tell all the way from Tanzania. So, <laughs> so we did. So this is Bishop Aludia Sanja and he is actually um, really the head of all of the Sakila Village and the um, International Evangelistic Outreach which is an orphanage, a primary school, um, a brand new high school, um, a trade school, the medical clinic, and have I forgotten anything? Bible school and radio In the station. Bible school. In the radio station. And, oh, and actually, yes, and, and brand new, um, it's just about a year old now, is a new um, radio station that reaches hundreds of miles um, um, t for people to be able to, uh, to hear the gospel. So um, I'll let him share his story. Tim and I are going to do just a little bit of a presentation um, and um, you guys just went to Arusha, right? Didn't the Grizzlies? Last year. Last year, okay. Okay, so not you guys, but your proceeds. Okay. They're, they're going to Uganda. Okay, awesome. 
Okay, so the reason that we call this MedGyver Healthcare in Tanzania is because, as you know, third world countries when it comes to medical care pretty much have nothing. And so we are going to share with you what we do, um, the wonderful people that we meet. We want to share some of those beautiful pictures of those beautiful people with you and to talk to you about um, health care and then how we get all MacGyvered up. Do you guys even know who MacGyver is because you're so young? <laughs> oh, yeah, they have a new one on Friday nights now, don't they? With the blonde-haired guy. Just doesn't cut it. But anyway. Um, so we just want to share with you um, some of the creative things that you do in third world countries to be able to, to provide um, health care. So Tim is going to start. And we'll just share this thing back and forth. So. Okay, I'm trying to stick the clicker. Go. Oh, I got the clicker. Oh. All right. So just to uh, give you some geography, um, if you're not familiar, Tanzania is in East Central Africa. Um, borders the Indian Ocean, just below the equator. Um, I think there's seven or eight countries around it. You can see we're real close to Kenya. You can see where the arrow is. We're between Arusha and Moshi, which are kind of the um, safari and climb Mount Kilimanjaro cities, takeoff cities for that area. And there's a number of national parks in that area. Um, so we're in north, central, northeast um, Tanzania. And you can see the other countries bordering there. Um, okay. Some health statistics you can see there. Um, just comparing to U.S. life expectancy, average age, you can see there's quite a difference there. Mortality rate, infant and maternal, um, also a big difference there. So um, working toward you know, helping um, Tanzanians and with their health care by establishing um, clinics and such so that they um, home grow people to um, become health care workers and take care of uh, the people in the area. All right, there's a, obviously a lot of tropical type diseases in um, Tanzania and Africa in general that we don't have here or have different um, uh, percentages at all. I can see HIV prevalence. Um, what is the population of Tanzania? Is it 46 million? 46 million, to give you an idea. Uh, malaria, there is a high rate because of the, the climate and all. The time that we're there, we usually go in May and June, is a low rate time for malaria because we're south of the equator. Um, it's actually moving into their winter when we're there. Um, and more in November, December, I think, is a higher malaria time. So, and a lot of GI problems, parasitic type things, um, the enteritis that causes um, death and, and morbidity in a lot of people, not just children. And there are varying levels of health care in different units in Tanzania. There are government clinics and hospitals, and some of those are for the, the specialty areas like HIV and uh, tuberculosis, for example. Then there are private clinics and hospitals that are um, usually church sponsored or sponsored from other countries and then the next level the lower non-governmental organizations that have set up clinics and a clinic what we would call a clinic here an outpatient clinic is called a dispensary there but it's it's very similar all right um, just to elaborate a little bit um, people live very remotely from a health care, so they have to go long distances. So there's times when people don't have access to health care for extended periods of time because of um, finances, transportation, just can't get there, can't get people to um, watch other family members while they go, so they just lack medical care in a number of areas. Also that means that they lack medical supplies, medications, those kind of things as well. So um, the dispensary that is housed now in the, the New clinic to the right, new clinic's been open two years now, um, works to see people on a, a daily basis like for common cold typical things in an outpatient clinic but also vaccinations, mother-child services, um, that kind of thing. There are certainly people that need to be referred on that can't be taken care of at the dispensary and they can be referred to um, 
larger hospitals or other clinics in Arusha, which is about 45 miles away and it's a much larger city. When we first started going in 2009 to um, provide medical care, it was in the old clinic there, which was essentially a, uh, a building that had four, three or four rooms in it that we just kind of divided off and, and set up a, a day outpatient clinic. So you can see the new clinic on the right is much um, bigger, um, newer, and it's going to provide more opportunities for medical care. Um, also with the dispensary designation in um, Tanzania, that requires that you have a doctor on staff, um, a nurse who's also a midwife, that combination can, be, can deliver babies, a pharmacy technician and a laboratory technician. And there's also a couple medical assistants and an office manager that work in this building. So there's, I think, seven people that work on the staff there. So there's a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be done um, and through IEO we are working hard to raise funds for that but um, really <clears throat> what's happening is that this area over here is kind of the um, education area where we can teach about good hand and body hygiene and things to prevent diseases and mother baby kind of issues. Um, the pharmacy is right here. Um, and the physician's office and the nurse office is, is kind of behind there. This area in here and then also out here is the waiting area. This is where um, patients are seen. This over here eventually will be a surgical suite. It is set up for that. Um, but those, and dentistry too, but those are goals that um, are further down the line. Okay. All right, the doctor that's currently there, um, Dr. Kassam, and in the slide to the left, he's actually um, working with one of the doctors that went with us on our last trip, which was two years ago, um, about record keeping. Records have to be kept on every patient uh, for the purpose of the government. They're submitted in monthly then, the amounts of patients and types of patients and such. So this clinic sees, I believe, 75 to 100 people per day normally and is open six days a week. I'm not open on Sundays. Dr. Kassam actually travels from Arusha and stays for the week and then goes home on the weekends. Um, the middle picture, that's where medical waste is incinerated. Um, that um, happens as needed, you know, um, from the clinic. And the lab is on the right-hand side and it's still done with microscopes, which um, we don't send labs out and, you know, get them back like we do here quickly. It, it's actually looking at the, the slides and stained slides and such um, in the medical. Um, people have been trained to do that, the lab people. I learned a lot about microbiology that I'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and the pharmacy is set up in a room and medication is provided by teams that go over and buy medication or leave medication that they haven't used as well as um, money provided to buy medications on a monthly basis, ongoing for general medical needs and then sometimes for specific needs for patients too. And the, um, for the past year now, this clinic's been set up with a fee for service so that some of the money that patients pay actually goes to defray the cost or part of the cost of the medications that they receive and need. So just to give you a little history on that, the first time that you're seen to have your first chart opened is three dollars and then it's two dollars for every visit after that for a physician's visit and then the patients um, are then responsible for paying for 50 percent of their total medication bill and then the um, international um, New Hope International um, through fundraising and the things that we do to provide funds um, actually um, pays the other 50 percent and um, before we go, we go every two years and it really takes, not quite two years, but it takes well over a year to get a team organized and supplies um, gotten ahead of time and donated and boxed up and either sent on uh, shipping containers that go every year out of Washington State or that are taken along by the teams that go. Depending on the year, there's anywhere between sometimes no teams, but up to three or four teams that from the U.S. that go over there at different times. This upcoming year, there will be um, three teams that go. Last year, I think there was just one, if I remember right. Um, there's people from Helena that go regularly. 
This year there's a group of nurse practitioners and <coughs> nurse practitioner students from the um, University of Washington that are going and there's often a group from Maryland that go, a medical team, and then we go every couple of years as well. But it takes a long time to prep for that and decide what we want to take. We buy a lot of medications there. We take money to do that. But there are some things that are hard to get there that we take along, like vitamins, which are really helpful to supplement um, food deficiencies and things. And uh, we take a lot of ibuprofen because it's hard to get there. They have a lot of Tylenol, um, and we can get most other meds there, but uh, those things are hard to get. And we take, what, antifungal cream, eye drops, some of those other things that if you can get them there, they're more expensive, so we try to take them along, too. Okay, and then just to, to just give you um, kind of some of the care that we provide, um, Simon is a patient that we have seen since we very first um, started going, um, and the MedGyver that we do for Simon is that when we first met him, he had a, a piece of wood with, with tire strips nailed to the pieces of wood that he used for shoes because nothing would fit his feet. Um, and this is caused from a parasite that gets into the feet from the ground and then the lymphs. Um, you, there's just no circulation through the lymph system and this is the outcome. We have some cases in, in the U.S. but very, very few. Um, and so the MedGyver that we were able to do for Simon is that we went to an orthopedic supply place and got donated some um, sh cast boots that you wear if you have a cast on to, to protect it from getting wet. And then we use the, the uh, cast stocking and we have Simon put that on and then he wears the cast boots. And um, if you want to see a man smile, he is so proud of his new shoes. So um, it's pretty fun. We, the only thing that we really do other than that for Simon is that many times, um, and actually as you can see, he's got an open wound right here and then there was actually another one in here, and we care for those wounds. But since the clinic has a physician and a nurse now, we didn't have to treat him at all last time we were there. So that was actually pretty exciting. He's just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, parasites are also very big, and this is just a picture of a parasite that was right here. We've seen parasites in the eyes, um, and this one we were actually able to um, surgically remove. Um, and we are able to do small surgeries if we have a member of the team that's able to do that. You wouldn't be wanting Mary Nielsen to be operating on you, but we do take some physicians and some GPs and some surgeons that do go over and do some of the um, specialties. Thyroid disease is also very, very prevalent. Um, does anybody know why you get thyroid disease? What can prevent it? Why do we not get thyroid disease? Yeah, because we, we love our salt. Popcorn without salt is like eating nothing. Um, and we have table salt that's not ex easily accessible. And so um, without that, um, goiters become very, very popular. And they, usually what happens is that the complications from the goiters are what takes their lives. It cuts off their trachea and they're not able to breathe. Um, and so we treat it with kelp, um, which is an iodine. Kelp with um, iodine. We do many, 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 many well checks. Um, and this little baby, by all means, his name is Happy. <laughs> Precious little baby. Um, this was actually a nursing student from Missoula College who came with us and she's doing a well check on a baby. Um, so here what you see is this young man over here was actually in an avocado tree and he fell out and broke both of his arms. And um, so those just got casted. Um, over here, um, you know, we don't have um, lawnmowers in um, Sequila are either the cow, the goat, or a machete. And this young man was using the machete and put it through his foot. Mm -hmm. And so this was um, one of the physicians that we went, went with us and a nurse and they were actually assessing the wound. And, it was a very popular, as you can tell, a very popular occurrence that everybody wanted to see. But we were actually, we did twice a day dressings on him for the six weeks that we were there. And when we left, it was completely healed. 
So that was pretty um, exciting. So another MedGyver is our mode of transportation. So you want to, oh, you can just go ahead. Do you want your notes? No, I'm okay. So now that the clinic um, in Sequila is functioning, um, the medical teams that come will entirely or nearly entirely do out visits, daily out trips to villages away from where we'll be and we'll travel for 20 minutes to an hour and a half to different villages. We usually go two or three days in a row to be able to see people, all the people that come and then also follow up with some people. So the way that we get there is because uh, there's a number of us, there's usually 20 plus translators and things. So um, conventional transportation is not going to work very well. So we're in the back of a cattle truck is what this is. And when it rains, you put a tarp over the top. Yep. Um, last time we got stopped down on the highway and um, one of the policemen came behind and looked and saw all the people in here and thought it was human trafficking. No, not really. Um, but he finally, and through the translator, we got the translation that said, this is not a passenger vehicle. But he let us go by anyway. <laughs> so um, we were able to continue on our, on our way. But um, we also transport the supplies then out to the out villages that we do. Um, are the roads all that good? The roads are OK. The highways are OK. Some of the side roads can be very um, rutted. And depending on the weather, if it's rained a lot, there can be some really deep ruts and slippery surfaces and things. Last year, we had to take a circuitous way to get to a village because the normal way down the hill was very muddy and rutted. So um, it's an adventure at times. So when we get to a, an outlying village, um, we set up a clinic for the day. And it's generally in a church. Um, and usually there's some chairs there. We do bring chairs and benches. Um, but we kind of just set up stations in there. And we have a station that's often outside that's a history taking station. And we do all our work through translators because um, not a lot of English is spoken. And so the nurses or intake people take histories from patients um, who've already received a number. Um, kind of if you go to the clinic, you know, if you had an appointment, we can't make appointments ahead. So it's kind of first come, um, gets the lowest number and so on. And, and they're given a brown bag with a number on it. That's why you know where we're at or who we should see next. And that bag then becomes their supply bag if they get medication. We also provide toothbrushes, toothpaste, those kind of things. So the brown bag is kind of a sign that you've been to the clinic. And um, it's an important uh, way for us to keep um, things straight about who's next in line and so on. So the intake is done outside. And then we have providers inside that are docs, um, PAs, nurse practitioners. We team nurses up who work together to see patients. Um, we have a pharmacy area set up. Um, we have a physical therapy area set up. If we have a dentist, we'll have a dental area. And that's often done outside as well, just because of better lighting. And we usually have an eyeglass station, too, because um, eye problems are prevalent there. And we started taking all kinds of old prescription glasses, but nobody knew the powers of those. And that was kind of uh, unwieldy. So now we take um, cheater glasses, um, reading glasses of different powers, and we have them set up. and, and it's easier for people to find the prescription that they need. And uh, most people seem to know the number that they need for their reading glasses. And the patient waiting area you can see is outside. And often that wait can be all day. It can be into the next day. That's why we go back several days, because we rarely get through all the people waiting to be seen. And pa people are very patient. It's hot. There's no breeze. It's hot to sit outside. Um, and they sit all day. and. Hopefully, we'll be seen. And if not, they come back the next day. And if they've come the first day, we see them first the next day. And you can see one of our docs doing an eye exam on a patient there. And sometimes these <clears throat> patients will walk for six to eight hours to come to um, the villages. And we sometimes are actually go to villages that have never had any health care provided to them. Um, so it, it, it is a, a, a wonderful service. And Bishop is the one who is in charge of setting up which villages we will actually connect with while we're there. Um, yeah. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with conventional physical therapy. Well, this is not conventional physical therapy. Obviously, we're not going to get people to go into a clinic and come a couple times a week for care. So it's generally a one-time visit for an assessment. And if we can provide some acute education or a few exercises, I've had some exercises 
um, print it out in pictures and then translate it into Swahili or I'll have a translator help me with that. Um, so a lot of injuries that are related to just repetitive, cumulative work things from working in the fields um, for long, long, long hours, many days, many years. And a lot of injuries related to soccer, um, motor vehicle accidents, um, those kind of things as well. A lot of developmentally delayed children, um, a lot of foot problems. Um, we've seen a lot of acute fractures. It seemed like last time we saw a lot of um, wrist fractures. We don't have good access to x-rays, but one thing I found out is um, a tuning fork works really good for fractures. So if you're familiar with a tuning fork, um, you put it over a, just over the hand. For example, it just vibrates. If you put it over a fracture, it's excruciatingly painful. So that's one way to diagnose. And then we took, take splints and braces and things. We'd run out of them. We had enough wrist fractures last time that um, we had to fashion splints out of some uh, casting material and what we had available, another kind of MacGyver in that way. Um, this is an interesting case. This is an x-ray. And this is a femur. You can kind of see that if you're familiar with x-rays. You can kind of see, does that look like a normal femur? No. no. Oops, sorry. What happened is a, a, what, the nurse came and asked me to come see a patient who said he thought he broke his leg. It's on a Saturday morning. So I came into the room. Actually, I went and looked for my tuning fork. Found my tuning fork. Oh, good. I'll check the fracture. So I came into the room. He was sitting down. And, and I asked the nurse to ask him how long ago he thought he hurt or broke his leg. And he, the answer came back a year ago. It kind of was started. And, and then he took his femur and with both hands and did like this. So he had a joint between his knee and his hip. Um, I said, I don't need the tuning fork. You have a broken femur. <laughs> so and he had happened a year ago. And he had worked for a year. He had a crutch. He had two belts. He had a belt below and above the fracture, just regular belts that he cinched down real tight. He limped a little. Didn't look like he was in horrible pain. Um, this was before we'd seen the x-ray, when I just examined him. And I said, well, I think we'll get an x-ray for you. And he went and got an x-ray. And this is what came back. And he actually brought it to a different clinic or different village that we were at. Obviously, we have no x-ray box. So we read this against the uh, light of the window. That's what the background is, the trees outside. <laughs> So we were able to provide money for him to have, or first we sent him to an orthopedist because we didn't know if there was anything that could be done that long after the injury. So we sent him to an orthopedist and he came back and said, yes, he thought he could do traction and put a rod in and a plate and fix his femur. That occurred just after we left last time. And the last we heard he was in the hospital a little bit longer and, and we didn't get any more follow-up past that. But when we go back this year, we're going to... Um, try to find him and see how he's doing because he's in the village, I think, or close. So, and when you talk about um, that he worked, his job was farming. So he went out to the fields and walked on this leg every day. You know, yeah. Um, if I get an ache from walking or running too far, um, I'm on the ibuprofen and complaining. Um, but he's for a solid year was out in the field making sure that he was able to provide for his family. Um, so this is just a kind of a, a fun story to share um, and that um, we met baby Claire. Um, baby Claire came in and even though um, it's, you know, 70-ish degrees, um, for the people in Sakila, as Bishop will tell you about the weather in Montana, it's cold at 70 degrees. And it's really cold when it's zero. Um, <laughs> but he... Um, so baby Claire came in and she was all wrapped in blankets and um, winter cl um, clothing and a little jacket. And so she looked like she was fairly healthy, but when we got her stripped down, baby Claire was four months old and weighed eight pounds. Um, and what had happened is that there was a, a traumatic death in her family and her mom no longer produced breast milk um, because of the trauma. and. Um, so they tried to feed her with cow's milk from a neighbor um, because they didn't have any other means to feed her. And of course, babies can't digest cow's milk. And so baby Claire was starving to death. Um, and so um, baby Claire gets nutrition. Um, this year we happened to have this young 
lady with us and she had just graduated from the University of Washington with a degree in nutrition and she put together a baby formula and again another uh, med guyver is that we didn't have any bottles and so we took little plastic Ziploc bags and cut just a tiny little hole and that became the baby's bottle. Um, and we saw baby Claire before we left almost four weeks later and um, she had gained weight and she was actually thriving. So um, the other thing that we were able to do was to buy a goat for the family so then baby Claire could have goat's milk. Um, this is kind of another fun little baby story. Um, this is the mom here and she's carrying one of her twins and one twin was um, thriving very, very well and the other one was just malnutritioned and not thriving at all. They had several other children. The father had passed away from HIV and they had pretty much nothing. And so we had some, after our first trip we learned and we get outdated donated um, baby formula from the hospitals that we take over with us and so we were able to supply the baby with nutrition and then we were able to um, get um, bags of beans and rice for the family to have some and the MacGyver is that this is <coughs> the taxi cab and um, so it took two taxis but we loaded up the kids the supplies and we were able to send them home. So hopefully we'll be able to see them when we go back and um, see if something happened. But again, there are also times when we cannot provide care. And this mom had come to us in an outlying village um, and she just wanted us to heal her little one. And really all we could do was just provide lots and lots of support and lots and lots of prayers with her um, because there was nothing more that we could do but this little one um, is eight years old. And um, this is our glasses station as Tim was sharing. And um, what we do is we have a little card with Sakila um, language on it and we have Sorry. them just read it until they find a pair of reader glasses that work for them. Eye problems are very, very severe in Africa mainly because of the hot, hot sun. And then their water supply before um, we were able, before a team from Wyoming was able to come in and do some well d drilling, um, caused a lot of eye problems. So, but there are some happy people with their new glasses. Um, each day um, ends with coffee hour. Four o'clock is coffee hour and we all sit around. It is a wonderful, wonderful tradition where everybody stops work and gathers and has coffee. And, it's, and you just sit and enjoy each other's company. And although we don't speak each other's language, we still give hugs, we still are able to um, share in a wonderful communication. And then also with our translators. Um, and then we um, have dinner. And then we do care conferences to talk about the patients that we've seen and who needs follow-up and um, who needs extra dental care or a surgery or whatever. Um, and then we sit in prep for the next day. Um, it gets dark at 6 o'clock. Um, sometimes we have lights, sometimes we don't, and we work by flashlight. And then these are just some of the absolutely beautiful faces of the beautiful people um, that we have a true privilege um, to be able to see. This is a Maasai woman, oops, um, with their beautiful um, color that they um, wear. Um, we also do well checks at the orphanage. The orphanage has 53 children, is that right, Bishop? Yes. Okay, um, and we do a well check on every child. Um, they actually have a record, and now Dr. Kassam also then makes a visit every Monday. They do have two children with HIV, and so he always checks up on those kids along with their government visits, um, and then, um, and then, 
um, we try to take shoes. And so here we're helping the kids and look at that smile. It just makes everything that we do worth it. Um, we always love sharing the gifts and the kids love getting them and the funnier and the sillier, the more they love them. Um, this woman here is Bishop Aludi's daughter um, and she's just an amazingly wonderful and beautiful woman. Um, and then we always take a gift bag that's full of school supplies, um, we always make sure there's a special treat, a couple little games, just fun things for the kids to have. And this man right there, Mr. Showoff, that's Bishop's son. <laughs> and he actually heads up the orphanage. And these are just truly, we, and these kids we get to um, see. And once they graduate from the orphanage, then they go on to the primary school that's also supported through IEO. And then now that they have the new high school, um, they can move on and go on to the high school. And sitting in our dining room right now are three boxes of chemistry supplies and, and um, microscopes that will be part of the high school that got donated from Alaska that will be going over. Are these mostly HIV orphans? Actually, their parents, um, a lot of them, um, died from HIV, and then where did the other kids come from, Bishop? Uh, they come in the, uh, f from the city of Arusha. Okay. Some little bit outside of Arusha in the villages as well. Okay. So they've lost their parents either to HIV or criminal acts or whatever, and, um, and their family members are there, but they can't afford to take them in, and so they become part of the orphanage. And they stay there until they graduate onto the primary school. Um, and it, as you guys will find out when you go on your trip, you come back so much more blessed and gift and rich than what you give while you're there. Um, and in this picture, this first picture, um, every one of us were presented with a hand-sewn, hand-picked flowers and then hand-sewed together to make necklaces for all of them, for all of us. Um, we will get shawls. I mean, they just, it's, it's, they're just the most beautiful and, and grateful people. Um, we, we do a lot of prayer time with them. This is a Sunday service and um, they're, they're very active in their singing and their dancing and I'll never forget one of Bishop's um, sayings is uh, when the Green Bay Packers were in the Super Bowl uh, he was just shocked at how excited we could get over cheese heads but we can't get very excited in church. So, um, and then the babies. Um, just here's um, one of our nurse practitioners holding a couple little siblings, a happy little face. And the kids love it when they, you take their pictures with the digital cameras and then they get to look at themselves. That is just one of their um, greatest treats. Um, and then we just get to care and love on the kids. Um, and Water does not come easy in Africa. There is a team that comes over from Wyoming and they dig wells. Um, Trusty is the name of the guy that heads it and Trusty was there for like four to six weeks. They attempted to do three or four wells and one was successful. So water does not come easy. And if any of you um, do any kind of rafting, that's what this is, is a water system and we Bought them in America and we had them um, brought over and they can actually pump the water then to make sure that their, the staff's hands are clean and, and that they have a way to um, practice hygiene within the clinic. And there is one of the most popular places for people to sleep which is on top of this building in Sakila um, with their sleeping bags and this is the view of the African sky at night. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Mr. Bishop. You are on, but you've got to get all hooked up here first. Are there any questions while we're transitioning here? Yeah. 
Hi, Mary. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm really curious about um, palliative care and pain medication that is available to um, individuals who may need it. You talked about ibuprofen, but sometimes that's not going to cut it with um, end-of-life pain management. That's about all there is. There's Tylenol. I mean, acetaminophen is available, but nothing much narcotic. Not the opioids. Nope. No. Nope. Do you coordinate with the National Health Service as far as receiving supplies, immunizations, medication, we, fluids? We do some, yeah. um, especially for medications. Um, we we yeah. get, um, some of the medications that we take over, we can get through them, and because you can get. Um, copious amounts for a very small price, and so we do, and sometimes free, so we do um, work with them. But immunizations are provided by the government. The government does yeah. take care of those. So they don't provide uh, pain medication? Not that we've been told that, you know, they just can't pass out. You know, well, we have to be a doctor, right? right. So. And I guess I don't know within the framework of the government clinics, like the HIV clinics, no, I don't know what, um, what the Prescriptions for that, we don't see those patients, so. Is it too Do you do HIV testing? We did HIV testing the first couple times, and it's very expensive, or at least it was then, and we had like one positive case out of 500, and so we stopped doing it. Then we just send them to the, the government clinic if they think they're, they've been exposed. In Arusha, how far away? It's actually closer than Arusha. It's in uh, Sengaru, so it's not very far, 20 miles, 15, 20 miles. Uh, do you know what was the second problem with the eight-year-old who can eat? I will tell you a story, though, um, to go along with that. While he's getting set up kind of on the same lines, but this was about a 20-year-old. And they came to an online village, and, and her sister said, you know, a week ago she was normal. And I thought, there's no way this woman was normal. She, she just had a very... Um, just her, her whole neural function was abnormal and looked like she was very, very developmentally delayed and her speech was just that she would scream and couldn't talk. And through a lot of translation, trying to figure out what had happened, she got malaria in her cerebral cortex. And she did go to bed normal. And she did wake up oh, wow. with nothing left. And she was the worker. Um, her sister said, you know, how are we going to work the farm? She's our, she's our worker. And so, um, and I'm guessing that probably sometime a type of um, CP or MD or some kind of a neurological um, retardation or delay was what was wrong with this child. Couldn't eat, um, did take a, a, a syringe kind of feeding, but couldn't chew or eat, so. Are you able to use cell phone technology at all, for example, in uh, s taking slides of uh, different blood samples and then uh, photographing that and sending it by, by cell phone to a laboratory somewhere? I never tried that. Uh, we have it. Uh, cell phones work at times and computer internet works at times, and so that's not technology we've used yet, but. It's, something that it's been it's been used in other places in Africa. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You guys' as moms who are giving birth, do you guys do any if they are tested for HIV and they're positive, do you any do you do any um, prophylactic medications and then do you recommend breastfeeding to them still? We don't recommend breastfeeding, but um, and we send those cases to the government clinics. Um, the Sequila Village um, dispensary doesn't really handle the HIV. Those are all referred. So um, we teach on HIV. Um, and last time we were there, I did a, a big presentation or teaching session at the orphanage to how to um, work with the kids, the two boys there with HIV. Um, but we don't, um, we, we refer all that out. So they do all that teaching and they do all that care. So, so, so the doctor's appointments were like two to three dollars. What is that in their like currency? How long does it take to earn that money? Um, I believe the average monthly income is around sixty-five dollars a month. Is that close monthly income for a family? 
Yeah, about 50 to 65, uh, somewhere there. Okay, so that would be a, you know, a day's work and a salary for that. I was going to raise a question about that because there's a lot of uh, debate over fee for service. On, on the one hand, uh, it's advocated because then people have a stake. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's been evidence to suggest that some people are completely excluded because they just can't afford even that minimal sum. Mm -hmm. How did you come down on, on that one? And it, that's a very interesting point. I think we we leaning or trying to lean toward the side of people having a stake in self responsibility and paying some of the amount that they can or what they can there. Um, I don't think anyone's ever turned away because they can't pay, um, but we we are trying to move them towards um, self sufficiency to their care. Yeah, I think that's a that's a nice way of handling it, it's sort of like a scholarship program that those who can afford to pay would pay and then they might pay a little bit more which would enable those who can't afford to pay to come for free. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty close. Yeah. We don't want, we'd hate to turn anyone away but yeah we want people to take some responsibility for their health care what they can. Yeah. And, so. and the, you know the reality, um, we were just discussing this in Helena this weekend, um, is that Tough times are everywhere, and our fundraising has really decreased, and we kind of face a deficit of around $200 per month um, to um, supporting the salaries um, and the supplies and the medications that are needed in the clinic. So, you know, we're working on some campaigning, but the reality is for every organization, donated funds are decreasing, and we're facing that also. So. We, ha we are kind of in a place where we have to ask, you know, to, to try to move them towards some sustainability and some ownership. Yeah, what I, is, the, like, the average cost of a like, prescription? <sighs> wow, we, but you, you take well, that Well, we buy we medicine, but I'm not sure what gets charged. It's probably comparable to what the fees are for the service. I, I you know, a couple dollars, I suppose, for prescriptions. I'm just guessing, because I... We buy the medicine, but you know when we're there, it's been dispensed for free. So, um, when the outlying villages, we still do free service. So, I can't tell you exactly, and it depends on the type of medicine too, obviously. That's like the, um, like, is it for a month's worth of prescription or six months, depending on how often like you go to villages, like? Yeah, and that, that's a good point because that's something we struggle with as well to try to start somebody on a medicine that's going to have, and the most we give is four months, I believe. Um, and is it, is there a team coming in four months that can continue that prescription? Or is that four months going to be helpful and then they're cut off from that? Is that going to be worse then at the end? Um, and things like um, specific diabetic medicine, we try to provide for longer amounts of time for people with hyper, antihypertensives, um, four months, and then they go off it totally. Um, one thing we do is, is treat everybody who wants to be treated for uh, parasites or worms, and we provide worm medicine for not just the patient that we see, but the whole family. And that provides um, three or four months of relief. And we think that's positive. You know, if somebody can get relief from GI symptoms for that amount of time, even if they recur, they've had a t time period where they're feeling better. So it's really, that's really a good question about medication and such. But one thing we, I'll say that we do do is we try to make sure that they have a means to get to Sequila, no matter where their village is from, we, we work with their pastors, we work with Bishop Aludi to, <clears throat> to make sure that they can get to see Dr. Kassam so their hypertensive medications can continue and he can give that extra prescription and continue monitoring. Now that there's a doctor there, that does yeah. work better, that way. One of the questions I always like to ask, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, is uh, in terms of what you bring back, the reverse learning. What, what have you learned professionally from your experiences there? What, what did you learn about physical therapy? What did you learn about nursing from your experiences in Tanzania? Mm -hmm. I think for me, sometimes simpler is better. We don't need a lot of complex things and machines and equipment necessarily, and education is very important, and that's always been important for me too, but just even more important coming back and just providing people with um, information to help them learn to take care of themselves. So, and keeping things simple sometimes is, is better than being more complex. And being patient, um, and to be happy with what we have and, and 
trying to transmit that to, to people who are very impatient about their care or their rehab or those kind mm -hmm. of things. Yeah, so when you think about how impatient or upset we get because we sit in a physician's office and we have to wait 20 minutes to a half mm -hmm. an hour and these people will sit and wait 10 to 12 hours so and and not ever complain so um, yeah you guys talked about physical illness a lot um, what about mental illness how do you treat that and what is the is it stigmatized there like it is in the US and what is the prevalence of it I'm gonna let you answer that because we don't really see patients that we have ever titled with a mental health illness not to say that they're not there but um, is there treatment for mental health illnesses or what happens with those? Yes or no, but uh, there is uh, some centers that the government have set up, like uh, in the central part of the country, where they, they are sent if it's too critical. Because most of the time when you have cases like that and then you take those people in the hospital, what they can do is just uh, uh, treat them with uh, sleeping medicine. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work for, <laughs> for a while that they recover, then they just take them to some of the centers somewhere. Like they have one in the uh, central part of the country in Dodoma. So they treat there, or they keep them there, they help them with just uh, some, some pills of killing the pain and let them sp sleep for a while, uh, something like that. Because then uh, not much that they have um, uh, equipment to see what's the real problem maybe in their head or whatever. So that's, that's the situation. Is psychiatry a practiced? Um, physician mm. profession. Do you have psychiatrists? Very few. Very. Very few. Yeah. Very few because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I don't really even think of uh, maybe one or two in Arusha, five hundred thousand people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You guys talk about taking like dental students over with you, and I just wonder like how far does like that dental care actually go? Like, the resources that you have? We do a really good job pulling a lot of band <laughs> teeth. Is that all it is? Just like a we do a lot of teaching, so we take over toothbrushes. <coughs> we take over toothpaste, but you know, really, um, the toothpaste is for the floor, and, and more than anything, but we just we um, we did have a little. Um, hippopotamus that we took with us for a few visits, but he disappeared and a little child needed a toy more than we needed a demo. Um, but we do work with them a lot on brushing their teeth. Um, we have truly been blessed the last few trips to ha have a dental hygienist and um, a dentist, not last time, but again, this time we have a dentist going with us, so they can do some special things, but even the dental hygienist um, will pull some of the teeth that she can pull. Um, that's just really the only thing we have to offer. We do make referrals for things that are bigger than what we can provide for, um, and we will send them to a dental <coughs> clinic in Arusha. And there's often, and most often children that end up being, a, I'm not a dental person, but um, they talk about four quadrants, and they have decay in all four quadrants. And start out just because of the time frame, they'll, they'll pull one tooth. But obviously, there's way more to be done, and sometimes those folks will come back and have more teeth pulled and all, and that's that about the best we can do right now yeah. for for that kind of care. And then with education, it is kind of funny because we have to work really hard sometimes to talk somebody into having a tooth pulled because they're so afraid. But once they see that pain's gone, they're back the next day to have the rest of them done. Okay. So, you know, I forgot to mention when I introduced you that you've been four trips now, and you have another one coming up in May. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the team? Who is the team going to be in May? What, uh, what mm -hmm. specializations do they have, and where are they from? They're obviously not all from Missoula. Uh, we have people from this year from Nevada, Alaska, Canada, 
and a number of places in Montana, um, Billings, um, the High Line, uh, Haber, Great Falls, um, Missoula area of the Bitterroot. And this time we have one physician going who's gone several times in total. Actually, uh, over half the people that are going in our team of 20 have gone before to Sequila, which would be really nice because they know the routine, they know what to expect. Um, so we have one physician, uh, we have about seven or eight nurses, a dentist, a dental hygienist, um, and we try to take it about 30% to 40% of our team as support people because they help with the, and they're essential for the history taking, for working in the pharmacy, for helping with eyeglasses, for helping in the dental area. And this time I think we're pretty close to nine or 10 people, about half, and they're gonna be support people. So we'll be able to do some other things with those folks too. And then I do some PT as well. But we've had all kinds of, we've had occupational therapists, massage therapists, nutritionists, um, nurse practitioners, PAs. Thanks. And this time, when because we only have one physician, what we will do is kind of have the physician sort of be a rover. And um, in the nurses um, then will team up and we'll have the stations. And we've been there many times. We know what to expect. We know what to assess for. And so um, we'll use the physician when we need them. But there is no scope of practice essentially in Africa, so we can um, work in that means. Well, we should hear from the bishop. Because yeah. It's... You're on, Mon. OK. <laughs> is, is there any specific areas that you might like to have people to be addressed that we haven't addressed or specific to the culture, the area? Um. First of all, I just wanted to uh, give a little picture of myself. Uh, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> a farmer. Yes, I'm a farmer. And uh, professionally, I'm a preacher. God has called me to preach the gospel. And uh, during that process and calling of God, uh, these things, other things for the human uh, needs step in like uh, medical, education, and so on and so forth. But let me say that uh, it has been a blessing to have uh, uh, doctors and nurses and uh, midwives that have uh, chances to come and help us uh, in the uh, field of medical in Tanzania, like uh, Mary and Tim and other uh, doctors and nurses who have come from Montana and other states to come and help us. Um, the situation in Tanzania, like you had, is about 46 million people. And also in those areas, there are so many clinics, but also hospitals uh, with no medical, I mean with no medicine. But some doctors, yes, they are there. Uh, some nurses, yes, they are there. But there is no really uh, medicine and uh, there is no uh, equipment which is needed to help the sick people who come to the clinic or to the hospital. And because of that, as a result, people who come there, sometimes they get wrong treatment because of the lack of uh, equipment to know the, the problem itself. And so it's just a blessing to see that the team come from here and help us uh, in the villages where, as you know, 80% uh, of the people in Tanzania lives in the villages where the infrastructure of road and also hospital clinics is not available very much there. And so the, uh, the team which comes here, uh, the reason mainly that we encourage them and uh, ask them to come is because they can go uh, with their experience and also with uh, uh, portable equipments 
uh, to those villages and help people right there where they are because it's very hard for them to travel finding uh, medical treatment or hospital in 10, 15 miles away because there is no uh, services like buses going to their villages. Uh, and there is no uh, income enough to travel and even to get that tre treatment and pay for the treatment even if they can go uh, and uh, get there, still they don't have the income to pay the treatment to where uh, they need to go and get the treatment which they need. And so uh, with, uh, with the people from America to come and help us, I would say that uh, uh, those who are planning to go to Uganda, you may consider and change your, your mind a little bit. And uh, since I'm here, <laughs> I am appealing to you to consider to come to Tanzania. <laughs> Actually, you know, this is not out of the question because each year they go to a different place. So it's possible that the group that goes next year could go to Tanzania. And you should talk to them about that before uh, you leave tonight. Would you come down and talk to Bishop Aludi about that before tonight is over, about the possibility of maybe coming, going to Tanzania in a future year? Good idea. <laughs> well, uh, does anybody have a question for the bishop? Because we've run about What church? Uh, it's an independent church, uh, uh, international evangelism church. International what? Evangelism. evangelism. Okay. Yes. So I-E-O. Mm -hmm. Yeah. International Evangelist. Outreach. 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 Okay. All right. What role does folk medicine play in helping or hindering health, the health of um, natives of the country? Did you say folk medicine? Mm -hmm. Or traditional medicine? Yeah. There is, there is, you can probably speak about it. There is witchcraft that people yeah. don't see. Is there anything besides witchcraft, the use of herbs or? Well, I'll tell you, it's really interesting because one of the things that's happened in Africa, as it does everywhere, are these, I'm sorry, these little companies <coughs> that perk up. And we would see patients that would have um, they yes. would come in with these prescriptions from these natural... I think homeopathic type. Yeah, people. and the, the cost of these things would be so outrageous. And the people were coming to us to get money to pay for this, not for us to even see them, because they were convinced that this was the only way that they could be um, taken care of. And we would work toward showing them um, better ways than spending money that was far above their income um, on these homeopathic medications. Um, but it, it, we saw quite a few. Yeah, and I think last interestingly, time. I believe most of them came from Dar es Salaam. There was a, more of a center of homeopathy, homeopathy there, but and that some of the tradition, though, is it? Um, it's, it, kind of a new thing. it's a new thing. I think it's coming in from you know, the Middle East. I'm not sure, but some of the prescriptions would have cost three or four hundred dollars, U.S. dollars, to fill, and we just there's no way we could, yeah. would or could that's do that. That's a very yeah. That's a yeah. great point of something that's happening that's not to the benefit of the um, people of Tanzania. Well, would you join me in uh, thanking the three speakers?